ASEAN in its ways is very rigid, you know? It abides by what, what, they, what they feel and what they agree. Put the government aside. Let's talk about within our community itself. So not everybody has the privilege of coming out. Hey everyone, welcome to new podcast series of Hiakwe Stories. Stronger Together Amidst Adversities in Southeast Asia. Brought to you by Came Out of the Closet and Asian Sogi Caucus. A series of podcast episodes which will be made available both in our Spotify account as well as in YouTube. It's intended really to bring so much space for LGBTI voices from Southeast Asia to be heard, to share our stories, and also to find out how folks like us will be able to work together in transforming the ASEAN region. Welcome to our podcast series, Here Quiz Stories. Listen to the LGBTIQ narrative from Southeast Asia in collaboration with ASEAN Sogi Caucus, where Farah, Proud, and Rees. This series is on Stronger Together Amidst Adversities as a Queer Community in a Time of Pandemic in Southeast Asia, covering six episodes and featuring multiple queer guest speakers from all across the region. And today is the second episode of the series. We will be discussing the topic around the diversity of gender in Southeast Asian cultures. Is it considered as ASEAN values and ASEAN identities? Hi everyone, my name is Riz, so I'm going to start with the opening of this podcast. Every culture around the world has their own set of cultural norms and rules for every person, which includes gender norms and identities. In Southeast Asia, our region is a melting pot of cultures that connect our values and beliefs together. Here today, we have Joelle, a Filipino living in Thailand, and is a program director at SHIP Southeast Asia, which is a program aiming to develop the capacity of universities in ASEAN region to contribute to the improvement of human rights. And Yen, a Tamil Indian and androgynous model from Malaysia, currently in Singapore, who both share their insights on Southeast Asia's diversity of gender in our cultures. Question 1. Hey Yen and Joel, welcome to our podcast series. Thank you for joining us. Tell us more about yourself and your involvement in the LGBTQIA plus community. You go first, Yen. Thank you, Farah. Um, so, hello everyone, I'm Yen. I do modeling for LGBTQ organizations, uh, for their merchandise, for their projects, any sort of movement. And uh, on top of that, I'm a volunteer for a page and I'm in the midst of starting my own movement called Blind Bodies to promote body positivity within the queer community. Apart from that, um, I am a full-time preschool teacher. I'm in the early childhood education, so that's what I do for work. That's pretty much it, yeah. Hello, my name is Joel. I am a, a Filipino migrant. I consider myself as a queer, feminist Southeast Asian scholar. So that's such a mouthful, but I think um, that encapsulates what I do. I am running a program called Shapes Here, Strengthening Human Rights and Peace Research and Education in ASEAN Southeast Asia, or Shapes um, We We are trying to reach this vision of creating a culture of human rights and peace through research, education, and inform um, and we're trying to build that critical mass also of academic activists. My involvement in the LGBTQIA community has been quite far-reaching because I've been working in this regional space for more than a decade now. I, most of my life in this regional space has been dedicated to working with young LGBTQIA plus people in Southeast Asia. What we wanted is to really occupy spaces and make sure that our language and our voices, not just our voices, but also our presence are in these formal spaces at the ASIM level. Um, and I think as a milestone, I want to share this. I'm, it's my first time to be a podcast speaker. So it's something historic tonight. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll put that in my bucket list. Well, you know, there's always a first for everything. There is a first for everything and it's always great. <laughs> How does culture shape our understanding of gender? Maybe Joel, you could start first. I think culture is a construction of being, society of a collective, of a community. So it's like a, it's a common understanding, a common experience. So 
and then it becomes more normalized, becomes more institutionalized. But I think culture is something that's not static, so it is evolving, it changes based on, you know, on the experience, on the lived experiences, and of course the factors that that, that affect common experience, lived experience. So, um, traditionally, I think culture has always been it's always been used to serve the common good, you know, or peace and order, or the pride and honor of a society or a collective. So based on that, I think gender is very much affected by how culture is constructed by, by the majority um, and how space and identity are defined by the collective. So historically, it's always been binary. You have the hunter and the gatherer, the 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 wife and the husband and all these stereotypes and 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 it's been so normalized it's been so socialized that we accept it as our truths so unfortunately because it's so binary that the nuances the the intersectionalities are actually set aside um and to a certain point because as i've said peace and order and we need to follow what what people think are is culture even if it's in a democratic or socialist or, or communist society it's still what the majority thinks is correct or is real or is true that has to be followed that has to be respected so their gender is very much reduced to what is comfortable for the many um, and unfortunately many of us the diversity when we talk about nine bin non-binary experiences or identities that is something that is still not mainstream or that is still misunderstood by a lot of people who abide by this quote-unquote culture that that for them yeah is is comfortable and you know that's it yeah so i i believe that it's there's still so much work to be done as i've said culture is something that's evolving definitely gender is not a binary and it's such a long way to go in this region well in this region we had multiple genders for example like in indonesia some tribes cherish the two spirits transgender people as part of the community because of colonization it created the gender binary norms and there's only he and she men and women which created a lot of segregation and was seen as something as abnormal in the in the region well joel since the philippines is a catholic country right how has culture and religion intersected with gender it's so confusing you know a lot of people think that filipinos well filipinos to, to be to be fair, are, are quite progressive. I mean, we speak our minds. We are very critical. We we say what's what's in our hearts and in in, the, in our minds. But I think at the end of the day, family is these basic values of family of respect towards towards institutions are very very strong in Filipino society. And I think that's why the I, I think it's still a gender issue. Philip the Philippines is the only country in the world that doesn't have divorce as an option for either partner to actually if they want to exit the relationship so that speaks volumes of how society of how government of how state still sees the importance and the roles and also the the agency you know of, of people to actually define what they want and define their, their identities um having said that definitely i mean when when, when we talk about issues of lgbtqia peoples I, I think it's where we're far off. Um, again, it's quite a confusing state in the Philippines because we speak so much. I mean, in the media, we see them, but then they're still stereotype. We're not on the spotlight. So it's seen as something like you can exist, but you aren't normal. I've seen this a lot. How about you, Yen? So from my experience, I think growing up, uh, the biggest issue that I faced was I've always liked things that was not considered masculine or, 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 you know, whatever that's supposed to fit the stereotype of the gender, right? So I'm born as a male, so I have to do all these manly things and whatnot. And then always raised eyebrows ever since I was a child from the kind of music I listened to, from the kind of clothes I would want to wear, I would like colors, even the smallest thing as what color I would like, you know, like how blue is for boys and pink is for girls and all of that. So growing up, I faced a lot of internal difficulties because I'll be told that there's something wrong with me. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't walk like this. I shouldn't talk like this. I shouldn't watch Powerpuff Girls. I shouldn't, you know, 
wear this color i shouldn't do this i shouldn't do that i should be into sports and this and that and whatnot so growing up it always kind of like put into my mind that like there's something wrong with me like you know and as a child i just want to be wanted or i just want to fit into the society i just want to be treated like everybody else but i never had that option but at the same time i never knew what i was doing wrong so it made me feel very confused it was uh, a very interesting childhood um, and teenagehood growing up i i feel that it's culture you know like what you said right so i'm from malaysia i'm living in singapore now and to be honest uh, there's not much difference going on there it's pretty much the same so i was born into hinduism and i feel that at least the folks in singapore malaysia they kind of like to pick and choose and kind of make it about religion when actually it's just their cultural norms like 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 joel was saying right like so you know the guy plays a certain role in a marriage the girl plays a certain role in the marriage within the queer society in our culture i feel that there's still a lot of binary thinking right like oh if a guy is not masculine whether he's gay or not if it's not hitting the gym 24 hours a day if it's not masculine he's not all of that then he's considered like the lowest like he's the underdog right like that's kind of something that i go through because i'm feminine so i'm i mean there is there is just fem phobia that is just coming from shobanism you know if if you know i feel that it doesn't end with straight men and especially in our culture uh, my culture i feel that it's a little bit more enforced Thank you so much Yen. I think coming out and queerness really come from personal traumas. Also we feel conflicted and we are cultured but have been given this fixed narrative of what culture is. We adhere to different parts of our cultures but not the usual what it means to look straight or the gender binary narratives. I also come from a Tamil family so in our communities masculinity and femininity are very enforced like you have mentioned. How has this been a conflict to you when it came to your queerness? I think that for most part of my life it was very confusing for me because honestly I never knew where I fit in my culture or my community for that fact. You know because it's always like I'm either to this or to that. I'm always supposed to be either ends of the spectrum. I can't be in between. Um but now coming growing up discovering who I am and all that I I mean I am Tamil I grew up with this culture. I love my culture. I mean not the negative parts of it, but I feel that like part of our culture is the the roles that people play in the culture, right? Like we have our caste system and we have like our roles that in marriages we have we have so many things that's very problematic, but at the same time we have a lot of beautiful things as well. And uh, one thing that's part of our culture that a lot of people conveniently miss out is how trans people are very celebrated. but i find it so funny that the tamil community at least in singapore and malaysia i think boldly say in there as well um do make life for trans people or i mean trans people have it definitely way worse but i think men who don't fall into that masculine category they go through it as well so i feel like you know for a culture that celebrates this by book this is exactly what i said by we pick and choose what we like that fits our convenience so if this is my mind if i find this weird i would try to say that it's part of my culture that's not normal I've always grown up listening to this like even with our attire we are always supposed to wear the traditional you know you know it shouldn't go below the knee it has to be a manly cut you know it always has to have that whole masculine outlook to it it can't be lazy it can't be pretty it can't be pink you know what not so for a long time i never knew where i fit in but then now at this point of my life i just feel that i'm tamil i deserve equal rights to my culture than anybody who fits into the so called gender norms or you know whatever they conform to be so this is my truth and nobody's going to take that away from me that's just how i operate Really love that confidence Yen. Being yourself out there is such a challenge. I'm trying to be visible and healing each day. For you to be the way you are, it's something I really salute you for. This brings me to the next question. Joel, you knew well that ASEAN as an intergovernmental body erased the language of sexual orientation and gender identity in the ASEAN identity narrative document. While we also knew that the when the West jailed and killed every person identified as gay or even cross-dressed 
cross dress back 150 years ago. Here in Southeast Asia, sexuality and gender identity and expression was unpunishable, but rather celebrated. How has ASEAN used culture and tradition to justify the exclusion of LGBT? IQ persons in their narrative of the regional identity, and how has colonization influenced this? So I think we need to understand what what ASEAN First is all about. But you're correct when you said that it is an intergovernmental body. But I will say otherwise because I think there's an emerging movement,、um, particularly involving the people of ASEAN. But I think what the traditional notion of ASEAN it is made up of ten governments with a motto. Unity and diversity, meaning that they will celebrate their diversity, but also they will be through through this intergovernmental body that you know there will be a meeting of minds where people you know in order to and maintain peace, prosperity,、um, and regional progress.、Um, but we also need to understand that you know ASEAN is still a very young. I mean, the colonization had just started. It's not even. I think. I think it's it's just more than sixty years. Since since it was it was established, so I think the colonization is still underway.、Um, it's still very much raw in terms of the you know, colonial experience. So, in terms of the government excluding, I think it's rather again my understanding.、Um, and ASEAN in its ways is very rigid. You know, it abides by what they, what they feel on principles that they agree commonly agree it. So anything that goes out of that. Out of that range, they will definitely exclude because, you know, in ways that they decide on things, it's always by consensus. Meaning that you know, if everyone needs to agree on a certain issue, so naturally, if particularly the issue of LGBTIQ people, if it's if one country, let's say Brunei, or let's say Indonesia, says that no, it's something that we shouldn't put on the table, then definitely that's excluded. So. Naturally, I think it comes from how they deal with things. Again, when governments, it's very much top down. When governments decide,、um, and I think this is very much felt until now, that marginalized peoples are not included in these spaces, particularly their language, and because this will rattle the whole agenda of the government. This will definitely affect the, the public support towards these governments. So they're very, very careful about it.、Um, we also have countries where religious. Leaders very much have influence, but we can also see that there is an emergence of ASEAN being owned by its people. Like, like this podcast, like like ASEAN Soji Caucus, can now see that there is a redefinition of what ASEAN is all about, and it is from the views and from the voices and from the lens of the people. So I think I am very hopeful that this will evolve into something that is more inclusive. In terms of, of gender, in terms of sexuality, be and, and rules and engagements that have to be in place, so that more and more people get accepted and included in in these discussions and in policies, and in also in you know in power sharing because it's very important. Again, majority if you are not part of the majority, then you have to wait or you need to assimilate, and that is very dangerous because there are diverse needs that are not met. And again, this is what I call neo-colonialism because. The people that should be protecting you, that should be accepting you, are the ones who are marginalizing you altogether, and that's very, very difficult. That's very, very dangerous, because where do you go next? When, when your very people, when your very, when your government cannot protect you or refuse to protect you, so I think colonialization is still very much present in our society. Sadly, it's something that is very much affecting. Um, the people that are already at the edge of the margin. I'm speaking with that in that tone. I definitely agree with you about how we are all trying to reclaim our identity through ASEAN voices. Our governments have very strong control over our lives and policies that affect our mental health and literally our whole lives. Where can we start to decolonize and deconstruct to a system that ties us down? Deconstructing, you are going against. You are raging against the system. I think. I think it's really giving spaces to those who cannot access the spaces. I mean, again, we need to understand the diversity. We need to understand also the need for people to have a share of that power.、Um, it's good that we have we have this we have this platform. But if if we continue having platforms, then we can snowball it into 
into something that you know we can we can involve people who reject the idea of gender diverse gender non-binary understanding of gender but i think it's really important for us to share and to occupy that space with as many people with as many members of the community as possible because without that then i think we are we will just be creating an echo chamber um of, of a few um it, it might not be this time but i think then we can we can create cracks already in a very very tight system thank you for that joel so yen share with us your thoughts on how we should reclaim our identity so that the states will recognize us and protect us okay so this is a very complex question because there's a bit of unpacking to do um so as a malaysian who's currently living in singapore and, and as someone who's trying to get in good graces with the government i think it's very i have to thread really lightly right so i feel that that is pretty much the case with a lot of people so this is my issue of how I can do something about it but I can't exactly do what I really want because then I'm going against the system. And if I go against the system, then there's going to be repercussions to me that's going to affect me and my life. And that's pretty much the same for a lot of people. Put the government aside. Let's talk about within our community itself. So not everybody has the privilege of coming out. Not everybody has the privilege of coming out of the closet living their best life you know not giving a crap about anybody i'm just like this is my gamey i'm just going to be me you know whatever you know nobody not everybody has that privilege so then comes the question do i choose my physical well-being over choosing to be myself or do i sacrifice that to just be myself a lot of people if they choose to come out today they will lose their families they will lose a place to live they will lose financial they have there a lot of people are still financially dependent on their parents and all that i am privileged enough to be able to come out and still have a roof on top of my head and i'm privileged enough to be sitting here and having this conversation with you but at the same time a lot of people who would want to be in my place can't so then comes it becomes very complex right so even in that case I think I had this conversation previously where um a member of a very prominent LGBTQIA organization in Singapore was telling me that you know we can't keep staying in the closet you know we have to come out we have to speak out you know if we stay in the closet nothing's going to happen and 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 we're always going to be you know here and what not but I feel that I think that comes from a place of privilege in my opinion because not everybody has that privilege like i was saying and having said that i think that or at least the community that i have experienced in malaysia and singapore in the lgbtqia community itself has massive issues so we are already a marginalized community and we are also oppressing each other which is i feel that a issue that has to be tackled first and foremost before we can come together as a community and reach out we have people outing other people we have people tearing other people down within the community itself and we have binary thinking within the community itself we have transphobia that goes on within the community itself we have transphobia that goes on within the community we have racism we have all this going on within our community itself so then I question myself sometimes like do we start here like where do we start so I feel that the problems within the community really has to be fought for before we come together as a community to fight for our rights when it comes to you know like I get it I get the whole you know for example in Singapore we are supposed to serve the national service and what not and I ask myself you want my talent you want my tax money but you won't give me basic rights like i won't be able to own a house till i'm 35 because i'm gay i won't be able to come out to anybody because i'm gay and and if i do come out then i can i i'm not you know able to get married for the next 10 years there's so many limitations to us and although we have section 377a and although it's not enforced we're constantly living in fear that it would be and i feel that 
our care community, at least in Singapore, is not strong enough. And I feel that it's something that has to be taken care of in the community before we go out there. And that's just my opinion. Yeah. We have to come as a community and need to congregate, start conversations and find ways that all sorts of oppression are linked together. I think the younger generation, they are very vocal about social issues. I think what we have learned with Yen and Joel is to have conversations for a start, also for the states to hear our worries and thoughts, and perhaps it will evolve into policy making so our needs will be catered to us in some point of time. So it comes to our conclusion that Southeast Asia with the diversity of gender and culture must be protected and supported by creating the environment system that is able to give equal rights for all regardless of ASEAN values dictated. It is important to us all to reclaim our identity by building solidarity and celebrate our diversity together in peace. Don't forget to follow Yen on Instagram at Skinny and Brown and Joel at Bullet Ain. That's it for our second episode and we'll catch you all in the next one. Follow us on Spotify for more of us. Thank you for listening. Follow us on Instagram at Came Out of the Closet IG and Asian Sugi Caucus. Catch the video on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Stay tuned for our next episode.